In this video, I'm going to run through the GCSE Combined Science Trilogy Physics Paper 2 on the higher tier. I hope it's useful. The first question is about one of the required practicals. This required practical is the one where we use an air track and timing gates to investigate the force math relationship. It tells you that a student investigates the acceleration using glides on an air track and light gates. The air track reduces friction between glide and the track to zero, and it shows you the setup in figure one, as shown here. So the glider was released from rest and moved along the track. The mass holder hit the ground before the car passed through the second light gate. Which two statements describe the effect this would have on the glider? So if the mass is pulling the glider along, that provides the force. If it hits the ground, that then means that the um, acceleration would decrease to zero because there's no force pulling it along, and the resultant force would decrease to zero. Those are the two correct answers. So the way to explain that is, first of all, the resultant force would go to zero because the mass is no longer pulling the, um, the glider along, and that if the force is zero, then the acceleration also has to be zero. In the next question, it says the mass holder should not hit the ground before the car passes through the second light gate. Suggest one way that students could stop this from happening. So there's a range of things you could do here. First of all, you could move the second light gate closer to the first. You could use a shorter piece of string so that the mass wouldn't reach the, the ground before it goes through there. Or you could, um, you could increase the height of the table. So as I mentioned before, you could have any one of the, uh, the <coughs> three answers that I've put on there now. So by moving the second light gate closer to the first, use a shorter piece of string or increase the height of the table. Any one of those would get your mark in this question. If you've got something else that you think is credit worthy, you could always show it to your teacher and they could check whether or not um, that deserves a mark. In the next part of the question, it says the student increased the resultant force acting on the glider by adding more masses to the mass holder. She calculated the acceleration of the glider for each resultant force. Each test was done three times. The table one shows results. The students made two mistakes in the mean acceleration column. So we're going to look at the mean acceleration column. Identify the mistakes the students made and suggest how each mistake could be corrected. So we're looking for two in the mean acceleration column. And obviously this is the mean acceleration column here. So if we look through there, we can see the first one is nice and clear that that is the first mistake. <coughs> is that she's not rounded um, the, that trial up. So for the resultant force of 0 0.2 newtons, the student hasn't rounded her mean value. So that should be to 1.3 as a mean there. So you can now see how you get the marks. This question is first of all, first part you say that 1.267 667 is wrong and it as it hasn't been rounded to two significant figures or one decimal place and you get the correction for rounding to 1.3 or basically saying to round to two decimal uh, one decimal place or two significant figures. The next mistake can be seen in the um, resultant force of 0 0.98 so this is this bit here 6.7 and the reason for that is that actually that means too high because they've included this anomaly here. So in terms of explaining that one you're going to have to say that the 6.7 mean value is too high because the anomaly, anomalous result of 7.2 meters per second squared is included um, and how, what the correction should be is they should then recalculate that excluding the anomalous result to get 6.4. <clears throat> so you can see now out of those improvements the idea here is that you'd have, you said that 6.7 meters per second squared is too high they get you the mark you need to recalculate the mean after excluding the anomaly that will be calculated to 6.4 I was just put in there how to do that so to so calculate a, a mean result remember you add the number you've got and divide by the number you've taken. Um, <clears throat> so here I've got two 6.4s, so I'll do 6.4 plus 6.4 divided by 2. The next question says, write a conclusion for this investigation, use the data in table 1. So first of all, I'm going to pull up the, the data from table 1 and put this on the screen. So you can now be able to see that I've <clears throat> dropped in that table there. So you can see that as a result of force increases, our mean acceleration also increases. But if we look more closely at the data, we can see 0 0.2 to 0 0.39. We've effectively multiplied by 2. And 1.3 to 2.6 is again multiplied by 2. Um, if we look <coughs> more closely, we can see that 0 0.2 to 0 0.59 is an increase of multiplied by 3, because that's essentially 0 0.2 to 0 0.6. And if we took 1.2 to 3, um, at 1.3, so it's 3.9, again, that would effectively be an increase by a factor of 3. So we can actually say that these results are directly proportional, because one increases, the other increases by the same factor. So you've got here now the expected outcome. So remember that 
If you use the equation f equals m times a, you would expect that force is directly proportional to acceleration. That will get you the mark. As I said, what that means is that as one <coughs> doubles in case of force doubling from 0.2 to 0.4, we get the mean acceleration also doubling from 1.3 to 2.6. You can also get other marks this question, which I just put up onto the, the screen now. So over here you can see the other accepted marks. So ideally the exam board wanted you to write this, force direct proportional to the acceleration. However, they would allow you to write that the larger resultant force increases the acceleration, positive correlation between force and acceleration, and that uh, mass slash weight of the holder for force was also allowed, if you use that by accident. In this part of the question, you expect to do a graph, since it gives you some information about what the student's done. And it shows you here that they've got the mass of the glider in kilograms and the acceleration in meters per second squared. It then wants you to plot a graph on here. Now it's worth three marks. You get um, two marks for plotting your points accurately. If you misplot one of your points accurately, you'd end up with a, as long as you get three or four of them correct, you get one mark. If you get all of them correct, you get both marks for plotting points. And the, the final mark is for drawing a correct line of best fit, which in this case is going to be a curve. So I've just uploaded a great example of what it should look like. You can see this person has plotted their points correctly. When you have to plot your point, you're only allowed half a small square in terms of deviation from where it should be. If it's more than half a small square out, you lose a point. Um, and then you've got a nice curve going through your results there as well. The next question asks you to describe the relationship between mass and acceleration. So here what they're after is that you, for you to say that mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. Because that means that as one increases, the other decreases. So the ideal answer here is the first one, that mass and acceleration are inversely proportional. However, they will accept as mass increases, acceleration decreases. That brings us to the end, end of this question. Please give yourself a mark out of 12, and then get ready to move on to question two. In question two, it says a magnet produces a magnetic field. Which diagram shows a magnetic field pattern around a bar magnet? And you've got to tick one. So only tick one here. And the correct one you need to tick is remember that the, um, the field lines show the direction in which a north pole would move if it was brought into a magnetic field, which means that they would move away from the north pole, but they'd be attracted towards the south. So we want the arrows going round, away from north, attracted to south, so it would be that one there. Question 2.2, it says figure 3 shows three metal blocks. The blocks are not labelled. One block is a permanent magnet, one is iron, and one is aluminium. Describe how another permanent magnet can be used to identify the blocks. So here are the marks of this question, guys. You've got aluminium is not magnetic, so the magnet would have no effect, and therefore it wouldn't move. The permanent magnet could be attracted and repelled by the other magnets. The key word here for the, the permanent magnet is you've got across the idea that it must be repelled, whereas the iron block is magnetic, so it will be attracted to the magnet. So you get one mark for saying that they have no effect on aluminium. You get the other mark for saying it will be, the iron block will be attracted to the magnet, and the final mark for saying how you know that the other, one of them was a magnet is that it must be repelled by the other magnet, the permanent magnet you're using. Okay, so <coughs> question 2.3 is a six mark question. It says figure four shows a toy crane. It says a toy crane uses an electromagnet to pick up and move blocks. Explain how the electromagnet is able to pick up and move the blocks. So here we're going to have to talk about the processes behind how that electromagnet works. So on the screen now is, is the level descriptors of how you get the marks this question. So to get level 3, you need relevant points, reasons, and cause are identified, given in a detailed and logically linked um, account. For level 2, the idea is that you, you've attempted to link it logically, but it doesn't really read and it's not fully and clear. And level 1, points are identified and stated simply, but their relevance is not clear, and there's no attempt at logical linking. So I'm going to move that one out of the way and put up the indicative com content that you should include, and we'll talk you through how you answer that question. So here are the things you should include in your answer. So the idea is completing the circuit by switching on a switch, turn on the electromagnet. There's a current in the coil around the electromagnet or around the, the iron co core. A mag magnetic field is produced around the coil and the iron core becomes magnetized. If you move the electromagnet towards the block, the block is attracted to the electromagnet. Move the crane, moves the block. If you switch off the current, that switches off the electromagnet, so it stops the magnetic field and that would then release the block. So you don't necessarily have to answer in all this, you don't need all this content, but that is the sort, of answer, the sort of things you should include in a perfect answer. So please mark your, your work and give yourself a score out of 10, and we'll move on to the next question. So now we've got figure 5, which is an ice skater um, 
things we're going to call skater A. It wants you to write down the equation that links mass, momentum, and velocity. And you should know the momentum is equal to mass times velocity. And that is what you, you need to write down to the mark. You could do it in symbols, which would be P equals M times V. The next part of the question says so the skater A travels with a velocity of 3.2 meters per second and has a momentum of 2,000 kilograms meters per second. Uh, 200 kilograms meters per second, sorry. You want to calculate the mass of skater A. So the first thing to do is write down the equation. So you get P equals M times V. Now what we need to do is we need to substitute the numbers into that equation and then rearrange. So you can see here now I've written in that 200 for my momentum is equal to m, which is my mass, times my 3.2. So now I'm going to have to change side, change sign, and do 200 over 3.2 is equal to m. So you can see here that I've rearranged it to get 200 over 3.2 is equal to m, and 62.5 then is equal to m. So I could probably round that to two significant figures, because I'm given two significant figures in the question, so I get m is equal to 63. So in terms of marks of this question, you get the first mark for writing, for putting the numbers into the equation, you get a second mark for rearranging it correctly, and you get a final mark for getting the correct answer. Now you are allowed to get 2.5 as your final answer. And you should the three marks of the question. So here in question 3.3, it says a skater A bumps into another skater, skater B. Skater B is stationary. The skaters move off together in a straight line. Explain what happens to the velocity of each skater I want you to use the ideas, this is really key, use the ideas of conservation of momentum. So usually if it tells you to use some ideas, you need to actually write down uh, what that is. So we're talking about conservation of momentum, so we need to explain what the principle of conservation of momentum means. So we've now got the first part answered, where we said the conservation of momentum states that the total momentum before a collision is equal to the total momentum after a collision. And that will get the first mark for this question. Now if you look at the, the, what the question is asking again, it's to explain what happens to the velocity of each of the skaters. So we're going to look at the velocity now. So to do that, we need to talk about the momentum of each. So first of all, skater A was moving, and then he bumps into skater B. So the momentum of skater A is going to decrease, and if his momentum decreases, the velocity decreases as well. And with skater B, that was stationary, which means he wasn't moving. So his momentum is now going to increase, as a result, and therefore um, his velocity will increase. So now we've got the final marks of this question. We've got the idea that skater A's momentum decreases, so the velocity will decrease. That will get you a mark there. And then you've got the other bit where skater B's momentum will increase, so the velocity increases. That gets you the, the third mark for this question. So please give yourself a score out of seven, and then we'll get ready to move on. Question 4.1 says figure six shows. Four newton meters. Each newton meter contains a spring. Which newton meter has the spring with the greatest spring constant? And I want you to give a reason for your answer. Um, so we've start off with A, which goes from zero to two point five. B goes from zero to, to five, and C goes from zero to ten, and D goes from zero to twenty. So the newton meter that's going to have the greatest spring constant is going to be D. And the reason it's D is because for D you need twenty newtons to extend the spring by the same distance. So therefore it needs a greater force per given extension, which is what spring constant is. Spring constant is force over extension. So the answer, the reason for that is it requires a greater force to provide the same extension. So you can see here it requires a greater force to provide the same extension would get you the second mark for this question. So a mark for D, um, and then a mark for the next bit. Now please note if you got the, the wrong spring, Selected here, you can't get any marks. So it has to be D followed by a reason. Question 4.2 says the newton meter in figure 7 will give it an error when used to make a measurement. Name the type of error. So you can see here, if you look at the top, it's not on zero. So we call that a zero error. And he wants you to then describe how this error can be corrected. So you get the first mark for saying it's a zero error. And then now we need to discuss how it can be corrected. So one way to correct it would be to... Um, Try and readjust your newton meter so it would start at zero. Or the other way to, to do, do the correction is to remove the value that's currently recorded on the newton meter from each of your readings. So you can see that now you can record the value and subtract from the readings taken. So if we record the value here, it would be one. 
um, uh, or you can adjust the newton meter to zero and then start taking readings from there. So the next question is, so the student hangs a weight on a newton meter. The energy now stored on the spring in the newton meter is 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 joules. The student then increases the weight on the newton meter by 2 newtons and he wants you to calculate the total extension of the spring, giving you the spring constant is 400 newton meters. This is a six mark question, okay? And when we've got a six mark question, that's going to involve combining one or more equations. So what I'm going to do first of all, is I'm going to just go around and highlight the things we've got. So we've got spring constant of 400 newton meters, or 400 newtons per meter. We've also got the energy of 4.5 times 10 to the minus two joules. And we've got the weight which in this case is 2.0 newtons. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record those somewhere on the screen so I can look at them. So I've now record these over here. So you can see that we've got E equals 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 joules, F equals 2.0 newtons, and K equals 400 newtons per metre. What I now need to do is try to think of some of the equations that link these things together. So one of them that I should be able to recall is that force is equal to spring constant times extension. So that's one of the ones I should remember. I can also look at my equation sheet and see that the energy stored in a spring is equal to a half times the spring constant multiplied by extension squared. So now what I need to do is I need to use these two equations. So force is spring constant multiplied by extension and energy equals a half times spring constant times extension squared to work out my extension. Now to do that, I'm going to have to find out the extension of both and add them together. So if we were to follow this one through, you can see that we start off by using this equation and we're going to substitute the numbers in. So we've got E is 4.5 times to minus 2, K is 400, and then we've got E squared. So we put those in here. So 4.5 times to minus 2 equals a half times 400 times E squared. To get the half on the other side, we times 3 by 2. And to get the 400 on the other side, we divide 3 by 400. So you get 2 times 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 over 400 is equal to e squared. To get rid of the squared term, we square root it. And that comes out as e being 0.015 meters. That's using the equation sheet and the information we got in the question. That will get you three marks. The next bit is to work out what happens in this equation then. So you now need to substitute the numbers into there, rearrange to find e, and we're going to add the two extensions together. So you can see here we've gone on this side then to get f equals k times e. Substitute the numbers in. f is 2. k is 400. Rearrange by dividing by 3 by 400. So 2 over 400 is e. e equals 0 0.005. And therefore e is equal to 0 0.005 plus 0 0.015 to get the final answer as e being equal to 0 0.02. In terms of the marking points of this question, you get one mark for this bit here. One mark for that rearrangement and one mark for that answer. You would then get one mark for that bit there and one mark for the answer. And then the final mark for adding them together to get 0.02. Uh, and that gives you the six marks for this question. Please give yourself a mark out of 10 for this question. And we're going to then move on to look at um, the different questions on a different video.